Good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone who's with us in church and to everyone who's joining us online on this glorious spring morning. I just have two uh, notices about forthcoming services. This evening we have a service here at 6.30, to which everyone is warmly welcome. Next week is a special service. It's a service of accreditation for Claire, who led our Mothering Sunday service here a few weeks ago. Claire is being accredited as a local preacher after all her study and commitment. And her service is at Glastonbury at 4 p.m. Next Sunday, the 29th at Glastonbury at 4 p.m. And now it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome our friend Lois, Lois M, who has come to lead our worship this morning. Thank you very much, Lois. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for all your welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've had the most beautiful drive <coughs> over from Cheddar this morning and a real sense, I have to say, of the goodness of God. Let's begin by praying together. Loving and faithful God, Thank you for your presence with us this morning. We come to you just as we are. Some of us are full of sadness and for others there's a real sense of joy. But you meet us where we are. So come, Holy Spirit, renew and refresh us. And we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. Let's begin our worship with hymn number 545. We'll sing in the faith, Be Thou My Vision.
the next part of the service has been put together more with young people in mind, and we're just adjusting the camera. Good. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Don't want to miss this bit. I have a question for you, and it's open to all of you. How do you show someone that you love them? You see, you can tell somebody that they love them actions speak louder than words. So how would you show someone that they love, that you love them? Give them a hug. You can give them a hug. Yeah, absolutely. That can be worth so much, so much more than words in that case. Anything else? Yes. Then just talking about the right amount of time with them for death, so you know what they've had enough. That's a very Patricia thing, I would expect. <laughs> yes. You keep your promises to them so they know they can trust you and your love. Interesting, that's a good one. Is this being picked up? Yeah, you repeat them though. You keep your promises <laughs> to them. So that they know they can trust you. Yeah. Um, keep them warm and fat. Keep them warm and fat. Oh, Absolutely wow. vital. Yeah. Steve. <laughs> oh, in these days of email and texting, we don't see many personal letters written, do we? But when they arrive, they are so personal, aren't they? And they do express that care and that love. What about chocolates? <laughs> <laughs> I like chocolates. <laughs> but you can give gifts as well, can't you? Anything else? Okay, well, I want to say, and I'm the only one I think here that can say this, is that the Welsh are very peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> and the Welsh have a very peculiar tradition. And I would like someone or some people to come and help me unpack a sort of gifts that people give to each other in Wales when they fall in love. Somebody can help me. I think some people may know what I've got in the bag. <laughs> can you just snap up from very carefully? They're very precious. There's a mic in there. There is anything there you can bring up to it as well. These are some very old ones which I will comment on in a minute. This gentleman, because it was undoubtedly a gentleman, about 250 years ago, he got carried away and made a fork as well. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, these are absolutely beautiful. Now, do you think they are? Yeah. Or is it just me? Can you imagine? Now, Slicer, if you just bring up that block of wood. This is where each one of these spoons began. Imagine the care and the time and the, the faithfulness that had to go in to carving one of these spoons with something like this, as small as this, 
making that block of wood into these beautiful, beautiful spoons. Now, why on earth would giving a spoon to somebody, why would giving a spoon to somebody show them that you love them? Why on earth do we have this tradition? Well, first of all, I think I would say is that there were parts of Wales still are that are quite poor. Um, and they wouldn't be able to match up to the sort of gifts that we have today. But they would be able to take a block of wood and calm over hours and hours and hours in order to make this beautiful gift. Now, one of the things I wanted to show you was that there are messages in the spoons. Now, how many balls have we got in magic? We've got two. And that indicates to the person it's given that they would like two children. <laughs> that, that's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? And then we have these links, these links that are symbolic of being linked together and for being faithful and wanting a long life together. Oh no, it's this one again that I want to show you. I, I don't know if there's a sad story behind this one. But when there's only one heart, can you see the one heart? That means that the person who is giving the spoon to the other person, has already lost their heart to the person, but it isn't reciprocated yet. So that's a bit of a sad story. Um, you do get some with two hearts. And, I mean, there's all sorts of things. In this one, I don't know the name of this, but can you see what's on that? It's a seed, yeah. This is made up of ebony. All these are made up of different woods. And this one is made out of ebony. And on the spoon bowl, there is a tiny grain, a tiny seed. I have no idea what the message was in that. Anyway, thank you. I will leave these out if people want to come and look at them afterwards. Of course, the bigger question is, how does God show us that God loves us? How do we know that God loves us? <laughs> Sorry. He gave his own son. He gave our own, you give me the strap line away. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge for the young people this morning is to look at John 3, 16. There are messages in the spoons, but the message of God's love, you can read in John 3.16, now when I was little, in the dark ages, <laughs> we used to be challenged to learn certain verses, and this is the first one I think I remember actually learning. So my challenge to you all, but to the young people particularly, is to look at John 3.16. And if you can, to memorize it. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for your great love for each one of us. 
And we thank you that we have opportunities too of sharing that love with those that we know. As the young people leave us now for their own group, we ask your blessing on them. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm told you will leave when I tell you. <laughs> I don't know if that's better or worse, but uh, it's a better view anyway. Let's gather our thoughts together with a, a beautiful, simple song. Number 628, Faithful One. Patricia is now going to bring us our gospel reading and can I just say when I chose this, I didn't know it was going to be a reading at the service on Friday. God works in mysterious ways. Our first lesson 
is from John, chapter 15, beginning at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we have our next reading, um, I would like to put it in context in its own time and place. Once a historian, always a historian. Paul was writing his letter to the Christians in Rome while he was in Corinth. And this was about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Interestingly enough, through the book of Acts, we know that Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem, where he was taking donations that had been collected for the poor amongst the Christians in Jerusalem. Christians in Rome at this time, made up of Jews and Gentiles, were becoming a, quite a presence there. And they gathered in each other's homes, occasionally uh, at the synagogue. Some were already experiencing persecution. But within a few years of this letter, the Christians in Rome were to experience severe, horrific persecution under the rule of Emperor Nero. So the verses we are going to hear are the culmination of Paul's arguments. Firstly, for the supremacy of Christ as the source of our salvation. And secondly, a plea to the Christians in Rome to hold fast to the faith. The second reading is Romans 8. 26 to 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, he also justified those he justified, he also glorified. 
What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is on the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. We shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We sing again number three, five, one. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Three, five, one.
John Wesley famously and reluctantly attended a meeting at a society of Moravian Christians on the 24th of May, 1738. The meeting was at Aldersgate Street in London and someone read from Luther's preface to Paul's letter to the Romans. Later, this is what John wrote in his diary. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that life, that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. From chapter five to chapter eight in the letter to the Romans, it's all about assurance. Paul goes into some quite highfalutin arguments about where we can stand firmly. And in these uncertain times, I wonder what gives us confidence. I wonder where we can firmly stand in this faith of ours. Now there's enough in the reading from Romans for six months worth of sermons. So I'm just going to pick up on three assurances that spoke to me again from the verses that we heard read. Firstly, the assurance that the Spirit prays on our behalf when we cannot pray. I've read this many times, and yet when I read it this week, I thought, how extraordinary. We all experience those desperate moments when words simply fail us and we don't know what to pray whether it's from the suffering and the loss of someone we are close to, or when life confronts us in other ways with unbearable pain, or we can go to global events, the sheer scale of famine in parts of Africa, or the barbaric events in Ukraine, words fail us. And sometimes all we can do is sit in silence in the presence of God. The problem is not that we know what we need, but we just can't find the right words. Sometimes we just don't know what we want, let alone ask for it. And in the middle of this confusion, the Spirit is interceding for us. Not giving us words to say or telling us what to pray, but we can have confidence that the Spirit knows our weakness and is praying for us. One of God's qualities is compassion. And the spirit feels the suffering of the world and participates in it. A few weeks ago, I attended a prayer meeting. To bring our concerns to the Almighty, as well as being thankful for many blessings. One person just a few weeks ago simply started to say, we pray for Ukraine. And she couldn't go any further. She just began 
to cry. We all sat in silence for several minutes. Some of us joined her with tears. And somehow we were caught up in that redeeming dialogue between the Father and the Spirit, and it was extraordinary. We felt that we were on holy ground. The assurance, secondly, that our God is for us. The complete sentence, as we all know, is if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, can I just tell you, I have a love-hate relationship with Paul, and I can have many dialogues with what Paul writes. And when I read this, I say, now, come on, Paul, there are many things against us events and circumstances of life, they seem random. They can seem meaningless, irrational from our point of view. And isn't hardship against us? Aren't principalities and powers against us? I could say a lot more on that one if I had the time. Surely, the persecuting world is against us. Death itself is against us. And the list goes on. So much so that at times we may wonder if God is truly for us. Paul himself faced the same struggles. He wasn't writing from a plastic bubble of ethereal peace. This is not a God who will make everything okay for us. When Paul writes, if God is for us, he is comparing any earthly opposition to the eternal power and presence and purpose of Almighty God. This God beyond time and space who has called us who knew us before the foundation of the world, who declares us to be members of his family. God will never let us go. This God is with us, alongside us in our tears and our suffering, as well as in our dancing, offering us unconditional love a love that is supremely expressed through the crucified, risen and glorified Jesus Christ. A limitless, impossible to measure love of God for each one of us. And thirdly, the assurance that this God of love crosses boundaries which are beyond our understanding. It was a real privilege to be present at the service on Friday afternoon when we remembered and celebrated the life of Helen. I came to know her quite well over the last three years as a local preacher tutor. We generally met monthly, thanks to Patricia and her hospitality. We met with Bethany, and sometimes we met with Craig too. You can imagine we had many conversations about our faith and the fundamentals of our faith. And they were fascinating. Sometimes they were outrageous. And Craig always felt the need to bring us back onto the straight and narrow of the Methodist Church. But whatever subject we talked about, and Patricia and I have both said this, 
Helen always landed on the same topic, the truth and the wonder of the resurrection. She had incredible confidence in the resurrection. And all Paul's arguments ultimately rest on the truth of the resurrection. When God said a resounding no to the principalities and powers of this world, when Jesus himself embodies and assures us of the promise that death will not have the last word and that no boundary will ever tear us apart from one another, God's plan for each one of us stretches into eternity. This is the story of our boundary crossing God when love ultimately has the final word. And it is this story into which we're all written as daughters and sons of the living God. I put a note to myself in my sermon notes. It says this, Lois, your God is too small. Living with this hope also has implications for the way we live our lives as individuals and as church communities. Now, how do we live the resurrection today? I want to finish with a story that we heard at Spring Harvest. There were some of us at Spring Harvest this year. And through the work of Open Doors, we heard about their work with the persecuted church in Iraq. There was a time when the horrific activities of ISIS in Iraq filled our news channels. ISIS is still in remote parts of the country, but their power has greatly diminished. Christians in Iraq suffered extreme persecution at the hands of ISIS. Churches were demolished. 80% of Christians left the country. And today, just 150,000 Christians remain. And we heard how in this bleak landscape, the church has begun to regroup and rebuild. We heard through Zoom about Bishop Daniel, who was supposed to be with it, but like many others, his visa didn't arrive on time. But we did hear from him how he challenged the churches wherever they were reforming to establish themselves, to establish themselves as centers of hope, with Jesus at the center, as people living the resurrection in the here and now. We heard and I've read how church centres there are distributing food, running children's activities, providing startup business loans, running marriage and parenting courses. There's one church that is teaching young people the skills that they need to rebuild the infrastructure in these demolished communities. And once again, the church in Iraq is discipling new believers. The challenge is this, how do we live the resurrection now? How do we reflect this love of God that knows no boundaries? How are we becoming centers of hope? offering words and deeds of life and of grace. Amen.
to take us into a time of intercession, we're going to sing number 20, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, risen, ascended, glorified, come afresh to our troubled world with all its needs, its tensions, its problems, and establish your kingdom here. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for those who are afraid, for families sheltering from constant bombing, those who are fleeing, trying to find safety for themselves and their children. May your everlasting arms hold them at this time. And we pray for those leaders who do have the power over life and death. Hold back those evil forces and give courage to those who seek peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the worldwide church, for those who are being persecuted even on this day because they follow Jesus Christ. 
protect and sustain them. And we pray for the churches in Iraq as they seek to re-establish themselves as centers of hope. We pray for this church and we give thanks for its work and witness in this community. For Craig and Elizabeth, for Robert, for the stewards and pastoral visitors and all who make worship possible in this church. Help us to be a center of hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Gracious and loving God, we ask for your blessing on all those that we love, wherever they may be. We pray for all those in need, those who are sick, those who are lonely, those who are grieving. And we particularly pray for Helen's family at this time. And in a few moments of silence, I invite you to name in you in your heart those who are in need of that special healing touch. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And for ourselves, we ask your forgiveness when we have not brought honour to your name. May we have the assurance that we are held in the surety of your love. And give us the comfort and strength of your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Are you, do you take up the offering here? You do. I mean, yeah. Okay, we'll take up the offering. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all your countless gifts to us. We thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. We offer you this money as tokens of our lives, that all will be used for the extension of your kingdom in this place. Amen. Just want to say thank you to everybody that's taken part in this service and I know all the hard work that goes into producing such a, a lovely act of worship. Our final hymn is number 548, Blessed Assurance.
shall we bless each other with the grace, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore.